much for coming today. Thank you for having us. In this rainy morning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so we have a, a very interesting and dynamic panel this morning. And first of all, I would like to uh, thank the DC Environmental Film Festival for allowing us to be part of this great event again in this year. So we've been part of the CFF now for six years, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Peter, right? Yeah. And it's really a pleasure to, to support in our small way what the CFF is providing here to DC audiences and audiences all around the world. Uh, so my name is Natasha Despotovic and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development and also the Director of the Dominican Republic Environmental Film Festival. And today we have a panel that's called Environmental Journalism and Activism, Creating and Sharing the Frontline Stories. And um, here with us uh, we have two panelists. Uh, physically present, <laughs> <laughs> and one panelist who is online present. Hi, Eladio. <laughs> he was supposed to be here, but we, we had a, a little hurdle, and he couldn't come. <coughs> so um, I would like to introduce all of them, and uh, I will start by asking a few questions just to kind of warm up, and then it's, it's your time to, to talk to them. So um, here on my right is Omar Shamir Reynoso. He's a Dominican biologist that has dedicated his career to protect species and promote environmental sustainability. He used to be the environmental <coughs> programs coordinator here for us, for GFDD, so he's a colleague. And he has worked for the Ministry of the Environment of the Dominican Republic and now works for the Marine Authority of the country. He is a person who implemented an impressive model of including the local community at the poor neighborhood in Santo Domingo to transform the fishermen from sea turtle predators to conservationists. So as we said, this is really stories from the front line. We have here people who actually work daily with the environment and, uh, and Omar is definitely one of them being constantly active. Has anybody seen the movie we screened? Mm -hmm. Oh good, oh wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So Omar will be here to share his experiences. On the side of Omar, we have Marvin Del Cid. He's originally from Guatemala, so he's a Guatemalan Dominican <laughs> by now. He holds a degree in communication sciences, and he has extensive experience in the visual and multimedia area. He worked for several media outlets in Guatemala and the Dominican Republic. Currently, he's working as an editor at Grupo Diario Libre, which is uh, a company that uh, produces uh, newspapers and magazines in the Dominican Republic. He has exhibited his photographic work on many occasions, both individually and on group shows. He has won several prizes for photography in the Dominican Republic, as well as abroad, including special mention in the Epifanio Lantigua Tourism Award in 2013 for his work in Dominican Treasures several times winner of, a, of a Epifanio Lantigua Journalism Award in the category of Sustainable Tourism. <coughs> and also winner mm -hmm. of the EWEA Award in Europe. Uh, he is the director of the film Biodiversity in the Dominican Republic and he's the member of the Dominican Republic Environmental Film Festival's advisory committee. Welcome, Marvin. And Eladio. Oh. <coughs> Hi, Eladio. <laughs> So Eladio Fernandez is an associate fellow and a conservation photographer with the International League of Conservation Photographers. He was born in the Dominican Republic and has spent the last 25 years documenting the flora, fauna and disappearing natural landscapes of the Greater Antilles. You probably saw his movie also last time. Uh, his work extends beyond simple documentation as he has contributed to the description of several species of animals and plants. Aristolochias of Haiti is his first effort at producing and directing a short documentary meant to portray his work to audiences that might not be familiar with conservation photography and with a rare group of plants. Eladio is also a member of the Dominican Republic Environmental Film Festival's advisory committee and has been very active and supportive and helpful with everything we've been doing. So. Um, 
I would just start with a simple question to which I really don't know the answer, although we are friends and we've been <laughs> friends for many years, but I really don't know how they really got interested into environmental activism and what really sparked their passion and how that trajectory no. evolved. So if you could just cha share how you started, what, what got you into it, and uh, what were some highlights that kept you going all through these years? One, uh, I, I will be the one to start. In my case, I was born and raised in the coastal community called Samana in the northeast of the Dominican Republic. So I was growing up surrounding by the coastals. So when I finished high school... Can I, can I just say, like, does anybody know where Samana uh, is in Dominican? Are you familiar with the country? <coughs> A little bit. So Samana is very well known for the humpback whales, yeah. right? So this is, we, we sometimes make jokes in Dominican Republic that all Atlantic Ocean humpback whales are Dominican yeah. because they all go to the Samana Bay and to Banco de, de la Plata, Plata. Yeah. Banco de la Plata to breed. Yeah. No? <coughs> so they make babies and then they travel north where they feed and, and live the rest of the life. So Samana is kind of a symbol of, of uh, humpback whales and that draws a lot of people to environmentalism. <coughs> yeah, definitely. So I started uh, as a volunteer uh, making an assessment of the humpback whales. So when I finished high school, I decided to study biology. So when I finish uh, my undergrad, I do my thesis with the humpback whales matching the, with the humpback whales, well, what part of the feeding route they came to Clave and the Dominican Republic. So I started getting involved in the conservation action around the country. After I finished my thesis, I started to work for the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources uh, in the Coastal and Marine Affairs. So I get involved with the sea turtle issues because my former professor, Yolanda Leon, she used to work with turtles. So even if we have been doing work with manatees and humpback whales, we start to work with turtles. And after that, I say I keep going, keep going, keep going, and start love nature and start love my job. And I grown up as a as a professional in the coastal and marine issues in the Dominican Republic. I think this is the. So I, I can just say from what I know about Omar because I, I also have a hotel property in Samana area. So Omar sometimes visits there. So we, we have lunch and then suddenly there is a text message and he stands up and they say, they found turtle eggs on that, yeah. and that beach, I have to go. <laughs> so it's real, it's, it's real. He really runs and, and yeah. goes to places and, and saves turtles and, and teaches people how to yeah. protect them. Yeah, definitely. This kind of job is 24 seven because uh, there is two issues that biodiversity don't recognize political boundaries, for example. So they don't know if they are in Haiti, if they are in the Dominican Republic. And other, they don't, have like a holidays or day off. Mm -hmm. So if the turtle uh, decide to nest uh, like a <coughs> holiday or, or in the weekends, that's, I mean, someone uh, have to take care of them to make sure that the nets not get uh, steal by some predators or, 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 for example, last week we have a marine mammal stranded in the whole weekend. So we have in two separate, one in the north and one in the east, and it was like a Sunday. So how you decide, I mean, there is no office. I mean, you have to do the paperwork, but it's uh, on a day of weeks. So it's, it's kind of hard to be, because uh, that's one of the problems to uh, work with the wildlife. So what, what did you do? I decided to go for the bigger ones. <laughs> <laughs> what in marine mammals were It there? was a humpback whale, and the other was a kogia. A kogia is a... Uh, it's uh, some kind of dolphin that live in the deep water, and mm -hmm. unfortunately we had uh, stranded uh, two of them in the east of the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, say, say, Oladio. Pygmy sperm whale. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you can you put him a little bit louder? Yeah. So. Yeah, I would also invite all of you to yeah. interrupt and, and thank you, Elania, to kind of contribute to what each of you is saying. Yeah, Because they actually, this is something I really appreciate in Dominican Republic, in the environmentalism, they're all friends and they work together. <laughs> yeah, So it's almost impossible. It's, it's You see one of them and you know that somewhere around there will be the other person because they are constantly working yeah. together and they are friends. That's for sure. Yeah. 
So Marvin, you want to talk about how you got into this exciting <coughs> work? And well, at the beginning, I have to say that my father was a hunter, a fisherman in the south of Guatemala. He was young and teach me the interest in, in know about uh, species in Guatemala. So for some reason, I don't follow him <laughs> as hunter <laughs> or something like that. But he draw very well, and my grandfather was a writer. So the books of my grandfather, <coughs> my, my father, make the, 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 the draws and he did their, his books. So all my life, I, I watched that. So I think that I, uh, I feel comfortable uh, making pictures and writing and look all of this because I learn that from them. So uh, <coughs> photography takes me to explore that world of nature. So uh, in that world, I met people like Eladio and Omar and Yolanda Leon and everybody else in Dominican Republic. So I feel that love for nature and species. So. I had the opportunity to work in newspapers, the Aero Libre is the biggest, maybe the biggest mm -hmm. newspaper in the so, so just to say, you come more from the journalism background, right? No, I am at, uh, in the university, I study advertisement. Oh, <laughs> even, even more to that area. But right, I love right. technology from, uh, you know, for I was uh, a boy, you know, I liked to, too much to play Nintendo and Atari mm -hmm. and uh, everything else. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's very easy to adopt technology. Right. And I am a programmer too. I can program HTML and uh, I don't pilot. With Omar, we have a project right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we are, I found a group of manatees in a place that no, nobody knows that. I was going that to ask you about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I called Omar, Omar, I found a manatee. He said, oh, are, you, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and two hours later, I found two. <laughs> and in the afternoon of that day, I found four <laughs> together. Yeah. And that, the and result. You, you managed to take pictures, right? And yeah, I take a, a lot of pictures and, and video of, of that. This is what, last year? So now, manatees. after working with turtles, yeah. right now we are working with manatees. So how many are there right now? You were telling yeah, me the, 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 the problem Dominican with Republic. In the last assessment, we saw around the country, we have uh, 133 manatees. But, but the problem that we have facing now <coughs> with that population, which is a, a small population in the north of Samana Peninsula, we count eight last year with the whole population we, using drones. Mm -hmm. But the problem is in the last year, we also received two of them died. Wow. So we know that we don't know the causes, but manatee is the only marine mammal declared by the national law uh, in danger, a critical in danger. So the population are really low. So we <coughs> find the second large population of the whole country, which is eight animals in one point. In one point. Yeah, in, it was on the northern. In coast, the northern right? coast of the Samana Peninsula, and uh, that population have a. Uh, uh, two interesting things. One of them is near to shore. I mean, most of the people are swimming around and the manatee are around and they don't see it. Like yeah. 100 meters from the coast. And that is the only place so far that uh, the manatees are in completely clear water. But since the hurricane, we have been facing yeah. problem because of the weather. Yeah. Eladi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since the hurricane, we have facing problem to find them again because the weather has been b really bad since the hurricane uh, until last week. But I was there uh, one month ago, and uh, the first time, more than 75 flies that I can find the manatees, yeah. I don't find any. Yeah. So you mean with the drone? With, yeah, the right? drone. with the drone. So I, I can find it. So we all know right now after the hurricanes what happened. To them. What yeah. happened? Yeah, what basically happened? we know they are here because last month so I I I take one of them oh, yeah. he is stranded, and we I mean he died three days after. But I mean at least they stay in the area. But the thing is we do we use two drones. So one make like a <coughs> random flight around the area. And the other one make like a programs, uh, like a programs flight. So 100, uh, 500 meters from directly from the coast, 200 meters to the right, and uh, go back to the mainland. So the drone flight like in that 
So that allowed us to make an assessment to where they are. And the other one, the random one, allowed us to see and figure out behavior if they are feeding, socialized, is a mother and calf pair. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it works, and we try to get better next uh, month. And we are working, uh, collaborating with a similar program in mm -hmm. Mexico, in Mexico. Cancun. They are using drones to monitor manatees, and we are sharing the knowledge about how to fly, the attitude, yeah. how how fast you can move over them. You know, it's very interesting for us learning about that. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, do we have a live view, uh, or no. we'll have uh, to wait a little bit? Two. So, <clears throat> thank you for that. And uh, let me ask you just another question. So, um, uh, what do you do? Can you give us some examples? Because we, talk, we talked a little bit about your interest in the environment, but what do you do to promote the awareness? What, what are some of the activities <coughs> or um, programs or products that you create? Because, uh, you, and a lot of that you're doing it just by yourself because you feel like it, not yeah. because any any company has asked you to. Last week I was in Bogota, Colombia, in a, in a workshop with uh, Daniel Lizarriaga. He's a inve uh, journalist, investigation journalist. <coughs> he investigates the Panama Papers and all the bridge and all that. And he says to me, "You can be, you can't be activist and journalist at the same time." And I say to him, "You are wrong." First, I'm activist, and after that, I'm journalist. So I, it's a, it's a line. It's a, right. I, I can define in which time I'm an activist, in, in which time I'm a uh, journalist. <coughs> but in the newspaper, I wrote uh, things about uh, environmental issues and for information and consistency. Uh, uh, oh, no. oh, oh, to denounce. To denounce, denounce. denounce things that I watch in all areas of the Dominican Republic, inclusive Haiti. So you are using your journalism yeah, yeah, yeah. to deny things? But sometimes we can publish some things because it's very activist things, you know. So we have come with Eladio and Yolanda and another guy, a uh, uh, Facebook uh, page. It's called Eco and Medio Ambiente. It's uh, uh, a game of words in Spanish. It's mm -hmm. like Eco and the half on the environment. <coughs> and it's destroyed in the icon. So in that page, <laughs> we received uh, the announces of everybody about uh, environmental issues. So we, we moderate all, all of this and we have the respect of yeah. the government and the people because it's Yolanda, he's an amazing biologist of the Dominican Republic, he's yeah. Eladio, uh, and me. So this is a, another way <coughs> that this is eco ambiente. We have more than 5,000 people in the, in, the, in the Facebook page, and it's very dynamic, you know, with the people. If one people watch, uh, for example, uh, 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 one guy are coding, coding uh, trees in a protected area and take a picture, send the, send the picture to the fan page, uh, we moderate and publish the, the name with information. And last year, the Minister of Environment asked permission for being part of the, of the page because it's closed. Right. Uh, we dis discussed that with Eladio and Yolanda, if it's possible to... to, to so you, you have <coughs> a good collaboration with the Ministry? Right now, yes. Mm -hmm. And they are using our page for know about... <laughs> To know what's, what's happening. Because, because they don't have, have ice everywhere. All around so the country. But, but yeah. we, we have, we have one. Right. They have, how many, how many police, the environmental police, they have? 122 um, around the country. In the around country. the country. Yeah. And we have 5,000 people. <laughs> so, this is Eco and Medio Ambiente is our patient. And it's amazing that things are happening with that. <coughs> so many solutions are yes, product of oh. this page. Eladio. Yeah, so with regards to the page, it's a Facebook page, Eco mm -hmm. Medio Ambiente, and uh, basically everybody that has a phone has the potential to make an announcement. That's the idea behind the page. So you have a cell phone, you're out in the street, you see this uh, truck carrying sand. Maybe you don't know if the, the person, that person is committing an infraction, but you question where that sand came from. So basically someone will take a picture of that and upload it on the Facebook page. And, uh, and, and, you know, we will moderate, the four of us, Marvin, myself, 
Yolanda Leon and Carlos De Soto, another photographer, will moderate. And basically, we need to approve the posting before it goes online. We we need to make sure it's um, you know it, it's reliable information. It has it tells you a place, a time, uh, you know. So once we deem it proper for posting, then we allow the post to go up. And uh, it it the but. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll, we know the answer to one of the postings, but we'll allow it to create a discussion because the page complies not only with a, a, a venue for posting the announcements and making them public, but also for discussing and learning in the process about a particular subject. For example, the fishing bands, which are big, uh, big subjects for postings. You know, when you have a violation of the lobster ban, Mm -hmm. At a restaurant, let's say you you go out uh, a sun on a Sunday afternoon with your family, and someone orders lobster during the, the lobster ban season. You take a picture of that, you post it up, and then people say, "I didn't know there was a, a lobster ban season." Then we have to explain for like the four hundred and twentieth time, you know, what the, what the particular dates for that for the lobster ban are. Right. So, so, oh, it's. It's uh, it serves two functions. It's a channel for uh, for denouncements, and also it's a channel for giving more information about you know infractions uh, and the environment, our laws, our em environmental laws, etc. We also get um, we you know the four moderators will get contacted privately, and this like Marvin says this happens, or like Omar says this happens on a twenty four seven basis basically we get a note at 11 o'clock in the evening and say listen I, I saw this and here's the, the, the image um, but I don't want to get in trouble and I don't want to post it myself so so we'll post it for them mm -hmm. if we deem it um, you know as a valid announcement <coughs> and, and we'll assume you know all the flack that comes with it ourselves so we're putting ourselves like in front sometimes for for some of the people that we know, they won't, they don't want to show their face, but we'll, you know, we're already in hot water with the Ministry of the Environment anyhow. So, <laughs> so you know, we, we don't mind getting in trouble or, I, you know, I've been contacted by the general in charge of the environmental police directly saying, you know, and he's always, obviously not happy with some of the things that are going up. And we'll try to say that some of these things have a political um, agenda or response to political agenda that they want to damage the minister of the environment, etc. But but that's not the case. I mean, we you know we see we we will review everything that goes online beforehand. So now that I have you, Eladio here, uh, and uh, could you tell us a little bit how you got into the environmental activism and what what are your favorite things that you do? <coughs> Yes, uh, uh, my, my background is business. I went to school for business, and uh, so I, I'm also, you know, I, str I strayed from my my original studies. Uh, I started getting interested in the environment through visitation, basically, national parks. And during those visitations, I got interested in a particular group of uh, animals, birds. You know, we, li we live in islands in the Caribbean, and we don't have you know, large animals. We don't have antelopes, bears, and stuff like that. Charismatic fauna. So our, our charismatic fauna is limited to smaller <coughs> things. Butterflies, insects, chickens, <coughs> rip. And uh, I got interested in that group of uh, um, animals and basically started to photograph and share some of the images. I noticed that people didn't know our birds. There weren't any images at the time. Uh, so I, I started to compile an image bank of all the birds of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, I started to travel to Haiti and then some here in Canada also that wanted to uh, work on bird conservation and their habitats, which was at the time very unique because no one in Haiti was really uh, conserving or working towards conserving any birds. So, so let me, so uh, I, now that you mentioned Haiti, Eladio, I think it would be interesting also <coughs> for people here. You collaborate with environmentalists in Haiti. You have good relationships and, and you work together with some of them. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yes, well, think about it. We live on an island. Yes, it has a political boundary and, and it's divided into two countries. But, you know, everybody who's a biologist, I'm sure there's quite a few. I know there's quite a few in the, uh, in the audience. But you know that, you know, an, an island is considered in biological terms as a, as a whole, not, not divided to political boundaries. So, so uh, you know, I've been working with this organization called Societe Audubon de Haiti since 2002. They're now related to the Audubon Society of, of the U.S. Interesting, interestingly enough, they chose the name Audubon because John James Audubon was actually born in Haiti. It's a, it's a little known fact or, or one that kind of is obscure uh, in, in, in history, but he was born in the area of Lakai, so they thought they had to, they, they put this group together called Société Alemande d'Haïti, and yes, I worked with them, been, work, been doing so since 2002. Our initial work and effort uh, concentrated in trying to bring people back for research into Haiti. You know, Haiti has, has this, uh, a aura of, of insecurity and, and trouble and so a lot of people stopped going and doing research and people also wrote off Haiti as a place where there's very little left and that is not the case yes there's little left but the little that is there is is very uh, poorly researched so we 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 managed to get some people interested like Chris Rimmer from the from Vermont Eco Studies Center and uh, uh, Steve Lada, uh, who had been working in the Dominican Republic for many years, and they went and did some bird banding, bird censuses over at, uh, the two parks that were in Haiti. Um, uh, in time, I got interested in other groups. I got interested in amphibians, reptiles. It turns out that Haiti uh, is also a great place for um, amphibians with uh, very many species that have not been described. <laughs> Now they're in that process, and this um, um, colleague of ours, uh, Blair Hayes, is, is is currently describing maybe over a, a dozen new uh, frogs, rain frogs from the genus of Uh Mostly, are all, all all these are concentrated in these fragments of habitat in, on mountaintops in Haiti that still remain pristine. You know, we often hear that uh, there's 2% forest cover left in Haiti. Yes, there's 2% natural forest cover, but if you use an FAO uh, measurement for forest cover, it actually goes up to 29%. But most of that is, is composed of mango trees, you know, breadfruit trees, and other um, uh, agriculture that meets a certain high standard. So, but 2% natural forest cover, and most of that is, is uh, um, uh, left over only on mountaintops uh, of, with very difficult access. So, you know, these, these patches hold a, a great diversity. Um, right now, currently, I've evolved from just being, you know, a simple hobby bird photographer to being more involved with uh, conservation. How, how can you not be uh, more involved when you see a lot of stuff like we do on a daily basis going on in the Dominican Republic um, and in Haiti. Uh, so I, I, lately I've become interested in this group of plants. They're called pipe vines or Dutchman's pipe. And 60% of the diversity for this particular genus called Aristolopia of pipe vines is concentrated in three regions of the world, Brazil, Mexico, and interestingly enough, the island of Hispaniola. And, uh, it, you know, I, I've started to photograph and through photography. The photography has become a tool for doing science in the sense that I can go pick flowers. And then, as it turns out, all these new flower species are in the process of being described uh, as a result of that work. And that was what the doc, my short documentary last night was a little bit about. Uh, also, that work is taking place in the Dominican Republic, Haiti. But I'm extending it to Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Cayman, Greater Antilles. Um, you know, I, I, I try, I, uh, I want to concentrate my efforts in the Caribbean, Greater Antilles, which is basically the backyard for North, Central, South America, but it's a 
you know, the, the notion that most people have of the Caribbean is basically sand, palm trees, nice beaches, and, and turquoise colored waters. And that's not the case. I mean, the evolutionary processes in, in the Caribbean are much more advanced in places like Galapagos and Hawaii. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's got the lowest point. For example, the island of Ismail has the <laughs> lowest, highest point in the Caribbean. And, and, a, and a, a wide array of habits that's in between. And they all support this great diversity of plants and, and animals. So that's how I got interested, and of course, a lot of it is threatened, and we just couldn't sit by and just photograph and portrait all these things without also being involved in trying to preserve some of it. And, well, you. you know, not all of it is people acting uh, with, for, you know, for the sake of being mean. It's, a lot of it is people just don't know uh, they're ignorant about issues or how to uh, work sustainably with the land. Uh, there's a lot of poverty, there's need. You know, people have an immediate need to feed their family on that day, not three months from now, not, um, you know, six months from now. It's today, I need, I need to put, you know, food in my kid's mouth today. And that usually is one of the most difficult factors to get with when we talk about conservation in the Maypro Republic in Haiti. Well, thank you, Eladio. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to you. Let me ask Omar a little bit like what you're doing to spread awareness about the environment and conservation and protection. Basically, thanks to, to my kind of job, <laughs> I have been involved in several initiatives. For example, here when I used to work for GFDD, they have an environmental program that go through the uh, private and public sector and different type of school taking the short short videos and uh, uh, promote recycling now as a government uh, agency we have uh, environmental programs that uh, we call uh, blue exploration that we we take uh, even if we are a island in the Dominican Republic uh, people live behind the sea uh, people don't don't get very often to relate it to the sea. Yeah, as we say, they turn their back on the sea. So, yeah. so, so really, and a lot of people can't actually swim. So, yeah. it's, um, so basically, not, not much interest in the sea. It's yeah, all so around, but not much interest. So basically, now we are in the program that taking the, uh, promoting the sea activity using the, the VR glasses. <laughs> so we put it like uh, 3D videos of people swimming and we put it uh, young guys and dressing like a diver and promoting this kind of initiative. Last year we impact more than 2,000 uh, students and the scope for this year will be 4,000. And basically the educational programs are to create awareness through the social networks such as Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram, uh, creating like a... Uh, like a short uh, related to the flora and fauna in the coastal marine communities, in my case. Because you, you are working in the government, how much is actually environmental awareness in the curriculum? No, it, uh, no there is no at all, nothing. There is nothing. nothing. Now uh, the government is uh, taking some modality from high school that they will be, the students receive more longer time of educational so we are taking a advantage of that. So, but the problem with that is we are facing the lack of infrastructure, such as like uh, audiovisual. And uh, for example, we going in town. So we have a really nice school, big one, but they don't have a power, for example, and they don't have a data show where they don't have a laptop. So for us, it's kind of hard to management the the, the, the new tools uh, like. Uh, like a video, audiovisual resources. So basically, we have been developing some kind of uh, like a quiz uh, on drowning uh, related to the flora and fauna of that area, of that particular area of the country. Uh, basically, combine them uh, the the reality they see daily with the things we want to communicate, because uh, there is not like uh, a standardized uh, awareness in the Dominican Republic. So we're gonna promote and create one. Okay, so I, I would like you to, to get involved uh, 
and uh, I do have many more questions, but I, I think I would like you to, to communicate your interests <coughs> and um, uh, your desire to maybe learn a little bit more about their work, and then we can come back to some more questions. So, I have yeah. a question. Uh, Marvin, uh, talking about the journalism, um, in, in your, I don't know, in Dominican Republic, could you say how many journalists are also activists in the environment? So many people mm -hmm. say that I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I don't know, don't understand why journalists journalists don't don't be interested in, in environmental issues. Uh, I think that is uh, I don't know. It's I guess it's very clear that Diario Libre is one of the yeah. only, I, I think, won't that <coughs> we promotes have, this yeah. type of articles. We, we no, right, right now, basically we, work. right now is uh, the second year of the national contest contest of environmental environmental journalism. I won the vote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. With no competition, so I see why. You're you're a pioneer. Here. Yeah. And there you, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, you won. It, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me because we need yeah. more journalism. Yeah. Journalists uh, working in, in that kind of, of issues. But really, I don't understand why they are not interested. But what about young, young people, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe studying journalism now? Are you giving any class or is there any? Miriam, I just, because we are such <laughs> a small group, why don't you introduce yourself? Because Miriam is a journalist as well. Why? Just when you ask questions, just introduce yourself so the other people in the room, why don't you say who you are? No, I'm I'm Miriam, <laughs> I am a journalist and I used to be the communications manager in the ATV. So I know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a journalist and you've been working in journalism for, we won't I say how many years because it makes you look More very old, older than, 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 than you are, <laughs> but for many, many years, yeah. But so maybe. yeah, I was wondering if in the school, I don't know if they are, Giving any yeah, for sure. I will be in Alto de Chabón School of Design mm -hmm. in, in May, teaching a, a little bit of photojournalism mm -hmm. with um, environmental issues. So mm -hmm. maybe as a part of their photography uh, yeah, program. program? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So you will I'll teach environmental it. photojournalism. Yeah, photo uh, 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 that be, uh, I think the, it's not in the agenda of the newspaper okay. because they are very interested in politics well, and farandula. Farandula. Farandula? farandula. 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 You know farandula? <laughs> <laughs> no. Gossip. 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 Uh, yeah. the environmental issues is not, don't generate money for them, maybe. <laughs> I think mm. that's the, the problem. Mm. For, for me, it's amazing. You know, everybody knows me, everybody wants to work with me. <laughs> so, uh, with Omar. Well, well, tell me what you experience with your Yeah, the, definitely. The, what, that's one of the lacks we are also facing. For example, when you are dealing with the species when the, in certain matter, so the journalists have to communicate the right things. And um, my experience with other <coughs> journalists is having bad. For example, we are dealing with uh, some humpback whale stranded. And uh, I, I say to the people, it's danger to touch the animal because it's a mammal and they can transmit it with some disease. So, the journalist asked me, so what kind of disease? I said, I don't know, the tuberculosis could be one, that one. <laughs> so the headline was that biology says the humpback <laughs> whale have tuberculosis. <laughs> I say, what? I don't say that. In my newspaper, eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I, I don't say that. I don't say that. I mean, the, the, the animal is alive, is a strand that could be a disease that can affect mm. us. I mean, okay. I just tell one. To, to, yeah, one You're possibility to, create to awareness, awareness yeah. to, to be scared and don't touch the animal. So, <laughs> and one other thing, for example, for, with the whales also, where a species, a uh, humpback whale come to the Dominican Republic and the picture is the orca. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very common. So the lack of this type of information is quite big. So for me, working side by side with Marmy is making me more comfortable because I'm sure we, I don't have a problem with the species, with the role that that species played for the ecosystem. So also the, the type of communication uh, of what are you communicate is worth it. So that's one other thing that I really afraid to work with other journalists because I don't 
feel comfortable what they gonna say after. Mm -hmm. for, for example, I was making, uh, I make uh, a series of articles in the Galileas by University of the Dominican Republic. I have more than 30 articles with video, photos, or some kind of species. But <coughs> journalists are, how uh, do to do used to, used to, used to do their, their job in two days. I go to a place, I watch, I ask for somebody, I wrote a little, little bit, uh, it's online. Or, or in the, for example, I made maybe three or four of that series that takes me two years. Until I, I feel sure that I have the right photos, the right video, yeah. the right text, yeah. asking everybody that is biologist how, how it works, and, and well, reading you're about doing the species. Real investigative <laughs> yeah. Yeah, investigative reading about the species. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, after that, I sent the text to Omar or Yolanda, uh, read please this, are you okay? Yes, okay, you can publish that, okay. Uh, so many of the journalists don't do right. that. So Eladio, are you there? Yes. Can, can you comment a little bit on, on journalism in Dominican Republic and challenges and uh, share your experiences? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was working on my crop, sorry. But uh, uh, yes, journalism, uh, as Marvin said, uh, a lot of these stories don't get covered in, in the press. And if they do, sometimes they have the wrong information. Like, for example, we've seen in the press before, you know, uh, an article in the newspaper celebrating that they were catching sharks off of the road on the way to the our airport is next to the ocean, so uh, between Santo Domingo and, and our airport is like a 20 minute ride uh, along the ocean. So these guys pulled out some sharks and they were selling the shark meat on the side of the road. People obviously stopped and, and took some pictures and that made it into an article of, you know, celebrating that these guys were killing the, the monster sharks. You know, that's the kind of article that will reach the press as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, explaining that sharks have been decreasing throughout, you know, you, you all know the story of, of, how, of, of how diminishing uh, the shark populations uh, have, have been over the past few years. But the way I, I, con I contribute is not necessarily through articles, although I, I should. I should try to get some of these stories out just as Marvin is. But I, I do books, for example, uh, I'll get a corporate uh, sponsorship for a book. They'll print 2,000 copies. This one's on a private uh, protected area. It's, it used to be the only private protected area in the Republic. Now there's a few. Um, and basically, what I try to do is through my photography, I put a face to things that uh, haven't been photographed before. You know, plants, animals, uh, landscapes. And I try to put them in a, in a publication and make them available to as many people as I can. I do, I put together also a presentation on, a presentation on each one of these subjects. This one's the latest. It's a book on Hispaniola palms. There's 30 native and endemic species on the island of Hispaniola. And all of them are covered in their natural habitats. Uh, they have essays on conservation in the case of the palm book on how to use native palms, for example, for local landscaping. Because if you walk around the city of Santo Domingo, you'll notice that all our palms that they're using for landscaping, except for royal palms and, and safe palms, are all from Asia. So no one's paying attention to our native endemic um, palm species, and they're becoming you know, more and more in danger uh, every day. So that's another subject, uh, you know, I have, I did a book on the metamorphosis of 12 native butterflies in the Dominican Republic. Every time I get into one of these subjects, I have notions, some, some, I understand the subject a little bit, maybe I have some images that will help me pitch the project, but, but mostly I'm ignorant about the whole thing. So I, I have to learn very quickly I do rear at home butterflies. I mean, you can't see my dining room table right now. It's it's like it looks like a lab. It's like uh, flowers and alcohol and stuff like that. I also worked in Cuba. I did a book on Cuban nature, one on Jamaican nature. 
And these books were given away in each one of these countries. They're part of what's called, um, you know, these corporations that sponsor these projects have some, a, a particular set amount budget for social responsibility. So, you know, a book like this complies with an education component, an environmental component as well. Right. So they'll support it, put their logo on it, and, and give it away to clients, friends, and every, uh, schools. For example, in Jamaica, I made sure the company gave them to schools so they would have access to the information. Um, now I'm in the process of converting all these books into e-books. And I'm also trying to present projects now that include a short documentary, the book, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Story Maps. It's an online um, platform that combines maps, images, video, lots of text to, to tell a story. So that way, instead of doing like a micro website for a particular project, you can do a story uploaded on the Story Map platform and have many subscribers and people look at it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to combine now, as of this year, and trying to do more multimedia um, projects that include a book, video, and a story map. And, and maybe that way it can reach more people with these stories, as opposed to publishing only on, on newspapers. Thank you, Eladio. I just want to support what Eladio is saying and doing. Like, my experience has been with the Dominican Republic Environmental Film Festival when we were making a program. <laughs> so we, of course, had some scientific movies and uh, intellectually challenging movies in the program. But I would always make a lot of movies that were basically movies showing just the beauty of nature, nothing else. Just how beautiful everything is. Because it allows audiences who really don't have that connection, right? It's very important <coughs> for them to connect emotionally. So it, it's like a beautiful picture of, of plants or animals creates a connection. And then from there, once the heart is open, you can, you can enter with the science and the environmentalism and the sustainable development, right? So I, I think the work of uh, videos and photography just connecting people to, to the environmental resources is, is very important. Um, Questions, Peter. <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, Peter. I'm uh, on the board of the Environmental mm -hmm. Film Festival and also the advisory committee of the Dominican uh, Republic Environmental Film Festival. And I, my question is about the role of, of film, following up on, on what you're saying. Um, and in particular, uh, Marvin, with with Kaku, I, I think it's it seems to me that that story has so much potential in, in terms of of educating uh, different groups of people all around uh, the country, uh, potentially, um, and also a lot of relevance in the, in the wider Caribbean. So I wonder if, um, if you could speak a bit about what your thoughts are for uh, a strategy uh, for that, that film, getting that film around, and also just in general for, for all of you, what the, the role of, of film uh, uh, in terms of, of educating people about all of these issues. <coughs> Yes, uh, Kaku isn't uh, think uh, as a document, a film at the beginning. When I met Omar in the beach one night with a green sea turtle, uh, yeah. it was a Huxley. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a problem. <laughs> no, no, I found the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. Okay. In 2013, okay. my, yeah. you know. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was my, fir my first time that I watched a, a sea turtle nesting. So I said, oh my god, wow. So uh, Omar told me about the beginning of the program with that fisherman. He said, do you want to come with me one day and know all those fishermen? He said, of course, I want to be. But no thinking about the fisherman, thinking about the turtle, you know? <laughs> So, uh, and th uh, uh, thinking, uh, um, it, 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 it Marvin, it maybe you should say a little bit about the movie because most of people did not watch the, the yeah, movie yeah. yesterday. The movie, the, <coughs> the movie is about uh, five fishermen of the poor neighborhood of, of the southwest of Santo Domingo, very poor neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Oh, like Eladio said, basically their main concern is to put food into their children's yeah, mouth. Yeah, and they are. So. The, uh, uh, <coughs> stolen the eggs and killing the, the, the turtles right. for the net to sell it to the, the, the black market. 
it's very expensive in the black market because it's, pro it's provided to people. Right. Prohibit. Prohibit. So <coughs> Omar uh, makes a program by, by himself to change their minds to predators to conservationists. So I documented that process in four and a half years. And at the beginning was two articles for the New York paper. So I wrote, I, I wrote the, the articles and we published the articles and it, it, the, the both article was very successful yeah. and, and for the people. So after that, uh, uh, I started to, to, to make more pictures and videos, but for me, not for, for the newspapers. So for, I am a uh, Getty Images contributor. So <laughs> I think I mean all that thing. So, and one night uh, I was uh, in bed and I was thinking about uh, making a song film, oh, dreaming about that, but I never can find that mission or theme to do that. And in the, in the middle of the night I wake up, oh, oh my God. I have an issue. <laughs> I, have a, I am working in my film one and a, uh, one and a half year. <laughs> So I, in the morning, I was with my boss and say, okay, do you remember the, the, those both articles about the fishermen and the told me, yes, yes, yes. He said, I am continuing documenting this for me, but I think it's a good thing for a film. Are you sure? You, you, do you know how to do a film? Not. But I think it's good. So it's a good thing. I said, okay, tell me, let me talk this with the owner <coughs> of the newspaper. Well, okay. And if that same afternoon, the owner of the newspaper called me. Say, come to my office, please. See, show me what you have, what you, what you got. I said, I, I show some pictures, videos, and what do you need? You say, I don't know. I don't know nothing about films. <laughs> <laughs> so, I need a producer. I think so. <laughs> okay. Let me find some somebody, and two weeks later, called one guy called me, one of the greatest uh, producers of the Dominican Republic, and said, "I need to talk to you." Okay, and uh, called me. Uh, at the short part of the story, said when he he saw the story, he said, "Oh my God, this is great." What do you need? You know, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> a, a script writer, because I am. <laughs> so he asked me, "Okay." Give in 15 days, show me a technical script, two pages, a resume of the story. And in the day 14, I don't have nothing. So, oh my God, I have 12 hours to, to give him. So I start to write uh, at the 10 of the night, 10 of the night, and I end the script and at the 6 in the morning. So I send him 16 pages. <laughs> and and he called me in the morning and said, who wrote that? He said, me. This is the script. You are? <laughs> he said, okay. We don't know. And I had one thing after that, and uh, I'm here right now. But the main purpose for, for me and for Omar and everybody else involved in this film is education. Show to the people that <coughs> Conservationism and poorness are, compa are uh, compatible. Poverty and Poverty conservation are compatible. compatible. Yes. Right. Um, the change of their minds is possible. And I am witness of that. Because, but, but need people like Omar that being with them all the process right. with passion the first. If you don't feel passion about this, you, it's only a job. Yeah. Yeah doesn't work because with Omar we was in that beach entire nights on the, the sunrise waiting for a, something happens and some of them no, nothing happens. Yeah. I come back to my home with the, the memory card empty mm -hmm. but we found that that uh, relationship with them uh, every time is more stronger. Right. Only talking about whatever so, so what's going to happen to the movie now? Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I just want to add, uh, I, I think uh, from my point of view, Kaku going to be the tool 
to promote conservation in the coastal community, not only in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Maybe if we have the chance to translate to another language, such as Creole, Creole or, fr or French, we can take a coup to those uh, French and English speaking country <coughs> or, or island. Caribbean, I think in the, yeah, in the Caribbean region. Yeah, because yeah, basically uh, uh, it's the same scenario in the whole Dominican Republic, uh, basically in the Caribbean. So if we got the chance of the opportunity and the funding to translate in French, Creole, or English, not subtitle, English, uh, uh, so will be the tool to promote that kind of activity around the region. You yeah. mean doubling? Yeah, doubling. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. start to apply another film festivals in the, mm -hmm. with the world, yeah. trying to the people oh, right. knowledge about what is happening in the Caribbean with sea turtles. Because mm -hmm. it, like say so Mar is it the same story all around right. and the same the same turtles. Yeah, Our exactly. turtles are the same of Haiti or Jamaica yeah. or Puerto Rico. It's the same population. So that is the, the, the point. Have a <coughs> is a journalistic job uh, film, the, the sense of the of the of the film. Uh, I think it works for education and awareness about yeah. And then basically, as I say last night, um, we, we have those problems that uh, we have a coastal community predating or stealing eggs, but we are facing new problems such as the sargassum, so the sargassum influence the, the now sargassum in the Caribbean are you, region. Can you, are you familiar with sargassum? It's a brown algae. Problem. Can, yeah. can you explain a little bit? Just yeah, that's since 2011, for some reason, that there is a few hypotheses about it, that uh, sargassum is of whaling the whole Caribbean in the amount, incredible amount. For example, last week, uh, Bonaire received like a ton of sargassum. They have to close the beach for more than a week, one week. I mean, so you could imagine it, the impact for the economic impact of that influence because affect tourism, aff affects real estate. Right. And also, it's so people literally don't want to go to to Ooh. countries where there is too much sargasso because they cannot walk on a beach. It doesn't look. It nice. smell like crap. Yeah, so and also, it, and also, and also, is affecting a species. So that's is a new problem. Even we still keep the other problem, the old problems, but also now we are facing the coastal erosion because of the weather. For example, this year it was awful, awful. In the northern coast of the Dominican Republic, the main nesting beaches for leatherback disappear. they disappear in two weeks. All, all, all of them disappeared. So we are facing new problems <coughs> also, or new threat, a new challenge. So the communication of through Kaku could be a tool to create awareness uh, and face that problem to give us the stronger to face the new ones and yeah. to, to don't, don't lose energy as, as an example, as, as an, an example. inspiring yeah. example of, of the change of attitude. Definitely. So, uh, questions? Um, yes, is the government um, can, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, I'm an, uh, the AP on Untamed Romania, so we had our screening on Sunday. Oh. Um, I just wanted to wonder if the government is sort of acknowledging the fact that there's all the, this erosion and um, that whether the, you know, they know that these, this, these nesting sites are really Actually, as a government agency, yeah, we, we are aware of that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is what we can do. The mm -hmm. only thing that we can do is uh, keep the mm -hmm. eye on it to see the when they try. Because the, the sense, I mean, they, they need to, to lay the eggs is so strong that they're going to try. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that is we have to keep the eye on it. But there is another problem. <coughs> as on the development country, we don't have the resources, the mm -hmm. staff to cover the whole coast. So maybe that's one of the problems. Mm -hmm. I remember one night when, when Omar calls me uh, later than, uh, at night and uh, asks me for a favor. Says, Marvin, my car is damaged <laughs> and the Minister of Environment doesn't have a car right now <laughs> and a turtle nest in a dangerous beach in Haina. And can you <laughs> pick me and, and go yeah, to that's the that's a funny one. He said, what? He <laughs> <laughs> said, okay, where is the nest? It's in the police in a queue. Yeah. Of with sand, you, you, we don't know. In the bucket. Yeah, in, in the, the bucket. bucket. So, okay, I pick my car, and pick yeah. Omar and go to the beach. Uh, it's very dangerous. So, Omar oh. said, I don't think that, that turtles will uh, hatch in the future. So, well, we do the effort. But 
They hatched. Yeah, they hatched. Yeah. So they, they hatched in, my, in the bucket. In the bucket. Yeah. yeah. They hatched in the yeah, bucket. Yeah, they, they hatched, hatched in the bucket. Two months later, he said, "What?" Yeah. 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 It, it was a because <laughs> also the the the, the <laughs> navy guy was the navy. <laughs> the navy guy they don't the handle thing. properly the eggs. <laughs> so I was. I mean, the the problem with that the protocol mm. you can't move the eggs because they. I mean, they get. Uh, yeah, so they get damaged if you move them. In the, uh, can you the touch them? Yeah, yeah, you can touch them. You but can the, touch them. But the problem is you can only move in the same position if you. So <coughs> and also they have mm -hmm. a some like a cover in the so that is has anti antibiotics right. and then if you have to put it with the same sand, if you don't do that properly, I mean there is no <coughs> opportunity to, that they hash. So this guy only have, I mean, the, the, the Navy guy only have in your mind that nets can be there because uh, the, the, there is no safety and he take by himself without without follow the protocol. I mean, he, he tried to do the good things, but he don't have the tool to management and he moved it and put it in the bucket. Mm -hmm. But after that passed more than mm -hmm. an hour, so I can put it in the cooler because the, the rate will be less so I let them in the bucket and yeah it was hatch it was my, my, it's a my, miracle. my daughters yeah. <laughs> uh, well another example well, in the middle of the film the <coughs> Omar quits the Minister of the Environment for me what do I do it well yes I can stay there for some reasons but nobody in the minister <laughs> do his job, so Omar continues, continues the job out of the minister with the, their own resources. Yeah, it's uh, one of the lack also, the, the follow-up, because uh, for mm -hmm. example, uh, last season we have less nets reported, but doesn't, that doesn't mean we have uh, less total. That may be because uh, there is uh, no one that follow the guides, I mean daily, using WhatsApp, What's wrong? What's I mean? Did the total get out tonight? What? So the follow up is very important because uh, if they don't feel like uh, they have uh, some eyes on it, I mean they're gonna maybe quit because yeah. in the first place they are losing money. So they, in their mind they are losing money. If they no one that keep tracking them because they see X as money. Because they, they need to feed. So one net represents for them more than 200 US. And the minimum salary in the Dominican Republic is almost 155 US. So yes. in one net, they have the minimum salary for the month. And the one turtle can put between three or five nets. So that's represent a lot of money <coughs> for them. And the season, they have a uh, uh, turtle nesting almost from March to almost December. So that's mean a lot of money for them. Thank you. Uh, we get, mm -hmm. I think you, did you raise the hand before? Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned manatees earlier uh, Can on. you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm Mariah Wilson. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, the film, a work in progress here called Silent Forests. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned manatees early on. Was it, um, was it a surprise to find manatees next to Dominican Republic? Was that the first time? Can you talk a little bit about that? About the manatee, they are really endangered in the Dominican Republic. So, as I say before, in the whole country, we only have report around 133 animals in the whole. So basically, when the large population is in the northern, in Puerto Plata, more than in average 33. When we find this small population, which is A so far, together, A together, that means the second large population in the country. So uh, the manatee is really in danger. Is the only marine mammal declared in danger by national law? So maybe in Florida, which is a subspecies, we have a bunch of manatee, but in the Dominican Republic, in the whole Caribbean, the wider Caribbean, it's a, it's, it's a big issue because it's really in danger. The manatee is the most endangered marine mammal in the whole Caribbean region. Well, why Caribbean. is that? Is they are killing it? They, they are die? killing, they hunting. hunting. Basically, in the Dominican Republic, the main threat then, they kill it uh, because of the meat. They use the bonds oh, to yes. medicinal Medicinal, medicinal purposes, purposes. Oh, okay. and religion in things. So wow. basically, religious, yeah, religion religious, thing. yeah. Oh. So they they say the bond they cure the asthma. Oh. 
And then, for example, now for an experience break, uh, we don't eat meat because of religious <coughs> issues. So there, in the Dominican Republic, there is a the belief that the manatee has seven kinds of meat. So the people looking like crazy because you are not committed like a sin if you eat manatee because it's a fish, it's in the water. So that's on a big, biggest issue, yes. Is it the same species as the one in Florida? Yeah. No, it's a subspecies. It's quite different. Yeah. Subspecies, it's the same species. Yeah. Um, my name is Melissa Lush. I have a film here um, called Person of the Forest on Orang Town Culture. What's, that, what's it called? Person of the Forest. Mm. Um, I am curious about the film. I obviously want to see it. Um, but I'm interested in what you guys are doing on the ground in terms of impact and like, I know you mentioned going into the schools and having some issues with infrastructure, but um, how do you hope to disseminate it large, you know, in a larger way there or, you know, in other places? Um, and then my other question is regarding social media. I know a lot of you is on Instagram. Um, I found him. <laughs> 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 We've been talking yeah, about Instagram there. works really well. Yeah, and well, I actually found his work some time ago, just kind of by chance. Um, and it's beautiful. The photographs are there are beautiful. And I know kind of the power of social media now is increasing, and you're connecting with different audiences, younger audiences. So I'm curious, too, how you guys are kind of tapping in. I saw Facebook, but if you're doing kind of multi well, yeah. yeah. Uh, in my case, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm. I try. I use Instagram as a tool to promote the wildlife of the Dominican Republic. So basically, if you go in my Instagram, it will be like a, like a. And I, I don't. I, I avoid to put it like a personal pictures because I realize that Instagram is a tool to communicate. A lot of people follow me, and you say like a, they call it influencers. For example, when we have a relief of sea uh, turtles. I publish it through the through the social media, through Twitter, Facebook. I say we have a release of the turtles. You want to join me? And people get uh, get there. And the the <coughs> the last two times I received the visitor of the influencers of the Dominican Republic. And the, I mean the the peak of Instagram gets like five thousand views like in a, in an hour. So definitely it's a tool. Three. Yeah, yeah. I, the newspaper will be a, a big part of this because it's a, a thing of the other year. Uh, but on the other side, uh, I have a, a big network of journalists of Latin America. In Bogota, I showed the film, uh, and everybody said we will be promoting our countries this film because it's important that everybody in Latin America understand the, the, this problem because uh, from Mexico to Venezuela, uh, they have a, this is the Caribbean coast, right. mm -hmm. the, and the, the same turtles, and we don't know what is happening because the people is, you know, is in another things. So, uh, but on the other, on the other hand, we have uh, two more brands supporting the, the film. Is Eco Petroleum? Yeah. They have a foundation, and Agora Mall is the biggest mall in, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the shopping mall. Mm -hmm. The shopping mall, they have a compromise with the environment. So it's a big a network. Commitment, commitment with the environment. Commitment with the environment. So it's a, uh, <coughs> and have a big network of clients. And you know, right. uh, we promote them in, in, in theaters on September. Okay. The, all the people can go for free yeah. to watch the film. Um, and the newspaper, the, 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 the people of the, what's the Mercado? The Mercadeo, the Department of the Market Department. Department of the Newspaper. They have a lot of uh, <coughs> activities around the film with children, with, uh, uh, in the newspaper. We in, in the film, you, you can see turtles, but not the names of the turtles, because the, the turtles that are labeled in the film, like Jaira, Jaira Rafaela, Rafaela. Weeby, Taina. Taina. We have all the names and sizes and everything, and, and we are thinking about uh, uh, make some children <coughs> book with the turtles and their names and their story and uh, some kind of thing. Yeah, because uh, 
one part of the document, I mean, one part of our work that doesn't show in the movie, but for example, in other part of the boulevard, the, in the awesome. sidewalk, we also have a sea turtle nesting. For example, uh, the prostitutes that are in the in the Malecon of Santo Domingo, I received a call from them. I so said, we have a seaside <laughs> promenade. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, have, we have ice yeah. everywhere. Yeah, we have it's a, a seaside uh, promenade in Santo Domingo where all the social life happens. Yeah, yeah it's called so Malecon. Malecon. Yeah. So I, I receive a call from prostitutes that say, okay, we have a turtle here. <laughs> can, can you come? Yeah. Do, do you remember yeah, yeah. the pimple? The pimple, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the prostitute yeah, 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 to, 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 to take out the, the eggs, the nest. Yeah, the, and then, and also... At three in the morning. Yeah, three in the morning. <laughs> and also there is a parking guy. I mean, actually the first turtle that I uh, measure and tag in the Malecon, he was thanks from one of the parking guys. Because we received the denouncement and I've been like uh, for a month daily to the Malecon and talk to them. And one day they, they called me, just they, he, they gave me a beep. Mm -hmm. He just uh, ring the phone and close. The several times I say, I don't know that number. So let me call back. And we say, it's me, the guy from the parking at the Malecon. We have a turtle nest in here. Come, <laughs> come right away. So that's part of the, I mean, the, that's other part of the work. Do you remember one Halloween that we were backing back from the aquarium, National Aquarium, oh, to Lefa Nest. Yeah. And Omar said, it was one in the morning. Uh, I, I, uh, he was driving, I said, Martin, do you think can we can stop in Guivia Beach? I think that today have to hatch yeah, 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 one yeah, nest, yeah. you know? Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's do it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> uh, yeah. Digging. Digging, Digging in the mm -hmm. sand, trying to find the, the, the turtles, and yeah, they are hatched, the, all the yeah. turtles. But left one, do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> Omar is, is digging in the sand. Uh, uh, we, I am with the camera and say, oh, look, look, Omar, what is that? And the uh, thing of a, a little turtle oh. like this yeah. in Halloween, you know, uh, like a thriller, you know, like, uh, something like this. <laughs> uh, we, we put out the, the, the little turtle, the only one left. Yeah. The only one left in the nest is what well, because he's trapped in the sand and the other eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we put outside and reacts. Yeah, and we release them. Release them. And, and, release them. and, and also the, the day with the and what is happening with one? We are oh, wow. yeah, 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 during the draft uh, two years during ago. During the, the film festival. During the film ah, festival, so. I received a call. I was working during the film festival, and I yeah, received a call. With, with one of our guests. With yeah, we to watch that. Yeah, yeah. We, we went in La Romana, yeah. which is two hours away, and I received a call. Say we have a total nest hatching in the Malecon. We say I am in La Romana. So in the way back, mm -hmm. we, we we make one stop at the Malecon, mm -hmm. and we we dig and uh, yeah, we, we have. Uh, and Stuart was with yeah, you. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, all these was. years, I always be in my home with a backpack with the cameras, lights, and everything ready. So you can, you can leave because I don't know happen. where they Omar receive a call and he called me. Listen, that doctor is I have fifteen minutes to, mm -hmm. to yeah. read it. Yeah. <laughs> so let me let me ask Eladio. What would you would you like to answer to the to the question a little bit about the use of social media? And the first question yeah. was impact yeah. at, at large yeah. impact um, at large of the work they are doing and the film. Yes, and uh, the recently film. Uh, we lost our <coughs> social media person at Ohio National Conservation Park. So so I basically panicked, and I because there wasn't a plan to get someone to substitute. Uh, the person who left. So I said, you know, you know, I called Susan North and I said, listen, I'll volunteer in the world you find someone. And it's an interesting exercise because you have like, the, the IOCB has 107 of the world's, uh, you know, best conservation nature photographers. Uh, most of them work for National Geographic on me. But uh, uh, so, so you would think that it would be, they would be highly popular and are both, both that's not the case. I mean, uh, a few of them are very popular, uh, but most of them don't get that many likes. And, and, and from my work, my experience, you know, I'll post a picture of like the most endangered animal in the Metro Republic and get 50 likes. And then I'll post a picture of myself reading to a chicken and being silly somewhere and get 600 likes. You know? <laughs> it, so you, you, it's really hard to Try to figure out what people are going to like and whether a like is, is significant 
uh, uh, it, it should guide you in terms of what content you're posting, and and that's not, I don't I don't think that's the case. Uh, also, in terms of social media, um, like Omar was saying, we we've, we've tried to get some of these influencers, Dominican influencers, to maybe adopt one of these subjects. For example, straws. That's very popular. You know, you know, promoting people not to use straws. We don't need them. And they end up in the ocean. So uh, I saw a recent effort with this uh, Dominican uh, actress, National Abogad, who uh, started promoting like a good uh, uh, recycling practices and the use and, 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 and you know stopping the use of, of straws or something like that. But uh, and and that was working. I mean, she has almost eight hundred thousand followers in the Dominican Republic, and and I'm sure some people picked up on it. But but you know, over time, she stops doing it. So you know, she will adopt the cause temporarily and maybe uh, you know and push that agenda of uh, for for sustainability and recycling, and then she'll just stop doing it. Maybe they think they'll lose like followers. In the process and stuff like that, I I try to keep people interested or or I try to post, and I, I gotta I, I know I sound very serious, but I'm normally very funny, so or at least I think that. Yeah. So uh, so uh, yeah, I try to make things as funny as and appealing as I can, or interesting in terms of telling a story associated with. With a particular plant or, or animal, for example, I'm researching these plants that I told you guys about, and you know they're a little, little bit erotic or weird in, in, this, in the way they're shaped. Uh, so I try to push that a little bit in, in terms of social media to I don't know, attract the attention of people who are um, who are, are uh, online. Uh, but it's a big mystery to me, and, and uh, you know, finally, IOCP hired someone. To take care of social media, so that's a big issue on my end. But I, uh, the conclusion from that experience is I can't quite figure out what people or why Paul Nathan has whatever five million followers and and, and some else who's doing just as important work has three hundred thousand or, or, or twenty. Um, so that's that's the bottom line. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eladio. Okay, just one. I was going to close. Just a yeah. brief question before we close. Hi, uh, my name is John Shirky, and I, 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 uh, I'm a biologist and a conservationist. I've been working mm. on, on issues uh, with respect to uh, conservation in, in the Dominican Republic since way back in 1986. So about, about 30 years of history working on things like this, and all the time that I've been working uh, with uh, American organizations, foreign organizations, as well as many partners in the Dominican Republic, there's always this effort to broaden the, the message and get the message out about mm -hmm. good works that are going on. Uh, and obviously, uh, this whole discussion today is about dissemination of, of success and getting the and getting more people aware, as well as hopefully getting more people involved. And there's all different ways of getting involvement. It can be uh, it can be promoting the word, it can be donating money, there's lots of ways for people to get involved and find their own particular way to kind of um, uh, get excited and, and do things. So with that, uh, with this uh, discussion and idea of kind of dissemination, getting the word out, obviously a lot of this is focused on uh, uh, producing the film, taking it around the Dominican Republic, perhaps other places in the Caribbean, uh, if you get the opportunity, bringing it here to Washington. What are some of the outreach efforts you might make to using GFDD to places like New York? I mean, obviously, there are these huge Dominican communities in, in New York and New Jersey, and people who might benefit mm -hmm. from knowing the message and might actually want to contribute funds or something to help. Is there, is there an opportunity to, to, to use a GFDD to, to, to get this out to the whole Dominican diaspora to get all the people that are involved? Uh, in, 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 you know, obviously, there's big Dominican communities beyond New York and New Jersey, too, but it seems like that would be a, a worthwhile audience to... Yeah. to well, that's kind of a question for me, I guess. <laughs> No, definitely, definitely. I mean, we have been supporting uh, all <coughs> environmental efforts and projects in the country and also in New York and, and in D.C. We have another office in New York, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. And we are very much in touch with the Dominican community and organize events, and it would be a pleasure to screen the movie there. Mm -hmm. So definitely, definitely. And um, okay. we'll, we'll be doing okay. that. Okay, yeah, I do. Um, I'd, I'd like to say, like, 
you know, I'm, I'm also on the board of advisors for the environment, the Dominican Republic Environmental Film Festival, and I have to say, not because I'm directly involved with them, but it's such a great initiative. I mean, it's yeah. they're taking, you know, these documentaries, these environmental documentaries, to all these small towns in the Dominican Republic, all, all for free, uh, and and. They're directors, uh, they're producers, uh, you know, they're all coming to the Dominican Republic and they all present their work. And that's so important and it's such a great initiative. I mean, there's nothing, I haven't seen any other initiative like that in the Dominican Republic in terms of promoting conservation. I mean, you can use the stories in other places from all these other documentaries, like Melissa's uh, uh, version of the forest. I mean, it's, it, you know, we don't have apes, but we could definitely use the message, the conservation message of, of, of having a story like that presented to the very public. You know, it, it serves as an example of what other countries, poor, right. like ours, or in the, the process of development, as people would like to call it, um, a, you know, with, under the same circumstances, they devote themselves to these conservation issues. And I, I think, uh, and I, I'm thankful for being also a part of, of GFDD and, and, and the DR Environment of Film Festival as well. Thank you, Alania. Thank you so much. Yeah, so when we started about, what was it, seven years ago, yeah, it was, it was really, we just kind of winged it. We said like, okay, let's see what happens, no? We, we saw DCFF here and, and Peter was the director at the time and um, and we said, okay, let's see what we can do. What we can do is we start the Environmental Film Festival in Dominican Republic. We started with, what was it, 15, 16 movies maybe? Yes, just it. A small effort, yeah, and it was unbelievable. And it's, I must say thanks to the guys like that, you know, that we have here, that we realized that there is actually a very rich platform in the Dominican Republic that's waiting, waiting for these films, waiting for workshops, waiting for programs and projects. And, uh, and one of the things we most enjoy in the DR Environmental Film Festival is bringing filmmakers from abroad and then, you know, having them spend time together with our activists and our environmentalists. And, and I think this is what has helped to, to keep that fire going. Because when we started screening Dominican movies at the DCFF, in the beginning, we, we couldn't find one movie. <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> we really had to scratch our heads and say, okay, what are we, we even started producing our own movies because there were no movies to screen. You know? But now it's just so beautiful to see that there are better and better products coming up and people are encouraged. And, and I must say, I really feel that whenever you guys come here, virtually or physically, <clears throat> and you see that there is interest and there is acceptance, they go back home and they are motivated to continue yeah. the work. So I think uh, others follow the example. Uh, others yeah. learn from you and, and, uh, and it really spreads. So I really want to thank the three of you, Eladio, Marvin, Omar, and, and thank you so much, not only for being here today, but for everything you're doing. And we are very, very proud of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>